The New Day greeted me on the SS-125 road, otherwise known as the Sardinian Oriental. This is Route 66 of Sardinia. It was built based on the former Royal Road from the mid-19th century, and in 1928 it connected Calgary with Olbia. When choosing the SS-125, do not expect a coastal road with breathtaking views of the sea. This road was designed in a time when the sea did not mean vacation. Coastal areas were often unhealthy, and malaria claimed victims here until 1950s. However, if the road itself is appealing to you, then the SS-125 is a must-see. This road is demanding and much loved by motorcyclists from all over Europe. It runs along the eastern coast of the island almost along its entire length, touching it only in a few points. On this route, the landscapes and sometimes the climate change suddenly, and the road itself is so winding that even the driver's stomach can be put to the test. Following to the north, I reach the vicinity of Balmain. It is a small mountain town situated at an altitude of 480 meters above the sea level. It is one of the most isolated parts of Sardinia. According to data from 2019, the commune was inhibited by 17 people per square kilometer. Not many also know that this is the Blue Zone, which is one of only six areas on Earth where the inhabitants live longer than the rest of the world. However, it was not my target, so having passed the commune, I turned onto the Via San Pietro road, cutting with sharp serpentines 200 meters higher into the Golgo di Bunei plateau, on which the Supramonte di Bunei nature park is located. Initially, the road is surprisingly good for the surrounding wasteland, and even when after approximately 7 kilometers and almost 300 meters of decline, it gently turns into gravel, it can still be driven quickly without having to use the off-road capabilities of the car. At this point, according to the Ferrata guide application, I should leave the car and continue on foot. My goal was to reach Via Ferrata di Golorice, which is located right next to the relatively new beach of Calar Golorice. New because it was created by landslide in 1962. It is famous for its high peak, 133 meters above the bay, and a natural arc that opens on its right side. But as I have an off-road vehicle and the trail seems perfectly fine, I decide to continue. So I'm going farther northwest. Driving conditions are still good, although the trail becomes more and more narrow, winding tightly between Mediterranean vegetation. The pebble and gravel surface is good. From the trail, other paths branch from time to time, so I stick more towards the azimuth, trying to choose the ones leading towards the Via Ferrata. The Golgo Plateau is a bustled area of several hectares surrounded by limestone. Its beauty is emphasized by unique panoramas, which looked even more beautiful in the light of the setting sun. Unfortunately, the path narrowed more and more with each kilometer, and I started to wonder if I would be able to get to this ferrata. There were no signs on the trail, so it made me wonder even more if it ever existed. The hill in the distance seemed to mark the line between land and sea, so I knew I was relatively close, but the changing surface made the ride increasingly difficult and it didn't bode well. And of course, I reached the point where driving was not possible anymore. I could play harder, of course, and lower the air pressure to increase the tire's contact with the surface and pull a little farther, but instead I decided to walk a bit to see if it made any sense at all. Here, I still had the opportunity to turn back quite easily, and there, as it quickly turned out, it would have become extremely difficult, because the trail had reached the width of the footpath, and far the driving was definitely not possible. So reaching that point, I was forced to retreat.
Again, I found myself in a situation where I felt I needed to be quick to find a place to stay in some nice place before it got dark. Relatively close, according to the Ferrata guide application, was another Via Ferrata, Punta di Plumare. What's more, the map showed that the trail I took off earlier could reach the seashore, and the place is close to it, so I decided to let go of this Ferrata and go to the next one. Third Ferrata in a row I missed. The road, as before, was good. Then it got a bit more difficult, which was announced by the sign saying that from now on only 4x4 cars are allowed. I had a little over 14 kilometers to cover, but as it turned out later, the average speed was about 13 km per hour, so the whole trip took almost exactly 60 minutes. As it was winter, it was getting dark quickly and it got completely dark before I was able to reach the destination. Another search for camping spot in the dark. Classic. The last kilometers led along a ravine. I tried not to use the 300 watts LED bar because the charging level was getting worse and its inclusion was definitely visible on the meter. But driving only with the low beam in such conditions was a bit creepy, so I was forced to use all my front lights. Suddenly, I came across a large rocky clearing that looked like a parking lot. The road continued though, so I thought that if for some reason there would be still no nice place to stay there, I would come back here, because it was really hard to find something worthy in the total darkness. I haven't got far. After a few hundred meters, I encountered a barrier. It was locked with a padlock. In these conditions, I was not able to see if there was any chance to drive around it, so I decided to go back to the clearing I had passed. I love the moment the engine is turned off and there is total silence all around. After illuminating the area with a flashlight, I saw that mountains surround me from almost every side. It seemed that I was a dozen or so kilometers away from any human settlements, although the cows I passed along the way might have proved it wrong. But anyway, I thought the place was perfect for a several hour time lapse. So, having checked the directions of the world, I determined where the sun would rise in the morning and how it would illuminate the surrounding rocky slopes, set up the equipment and after the standard evening activities in the form of dinner, quick splashes, cigarette and a cold beer, I went to sleep, planning to approach the ferrata the next day. Yes, the rear part of the safety cage is also an excellent exercise device. This front lever will be perfect one day, but this progression also gives a nice kick in the morning. Especially that it greeted me with excellent weather. It was very warm, for January in Europe of course, and I felt that today I would finally go on the trail and climb a bit. From the perspective of the drone, Terno, the spot where I spent the night, called Plano e Murta, was a dry riverbed. It's good that there were no flash floods anywhere in the area, because I might be surprised. The area in which I found myself borders the Margine Plateau at 800 meters above sea level and the aforementioned Golgo at 400 meters above sea level. It runs parallel to the coast for a length of about 15 kilometers. It is dominated by Jurassic limestone, stretching from the sea to the west, deeply carved by numerous water curses, but there are also basalt shelves characteristic of the basaltic Golgo region.
The whole vast and narrow valley is called Kodula di Sisin, from the river that sometimes flows along. Separated from the sea by a chain of limestone mountains prevented it from breaking through to it earlier. A walk towards the sea takes about 30 minutes, and the valley here seems particularly high and majestic. It is said that it rains here only between October and January, with an annual rainfall of about 50 days, which makes this area perfect for an active holiday. Following the path interwining with the riverbed, first north and then gradually turning east, I pass quite unexpectedly a restaurant that is open from April to October. Kodula ends in Kala Sisin, almost 200 meters wide beach, indicated on the oldest maps as Port Sisin. This is one of the most beautiful beaches in Sardinia. Historically, it has been used as a landing site for coal loads. Tools found in the area indicate human presence 4,000 years ago. There is no coal remains nowadays, but Kala Sisin is distinguished by the exceptionally wide, small and medium-sized pebbles that make it up. The seabed consists of white sand with large lime grains and rocks rounded by the sea, which only intensifies the turquoise shade of the water thanks to the play of sunlight reflected from it. Ironically, although it is one of the most beautiful seaside spots I've ever been to, it has a unique mountain appearance. To the south and north, it is surrounded by a particularly high cliffs in this area, almost 500 meters high. And at that time, it was all mine. It was a bit of a surprise, because I was just going out of this beach that I found. And I thought it's another time that I wouldn't be able to find a way to the ferrata. But have a look. I think I'm on the right path. Just let's see. Uh, what we can find there. As you can see, it's um, it's quite narrow. I would say it's quite challenging. But the views are nice. Yeah. There's a sea. Right. So, let's continue. And check what we can find. There. You will probably find out ah, in the next shot. Look at this. Yeah. According to the guides, Via Ferrata Plumare is the most picturesque and wild in all of Sardinia. The only way to reach it is by following an arduous trail that follows a narrow ledge that horizontally cuts across the Great Wall of Punta Plumare, providing exceptional views of Cala Sicin Beach and the Gulf of Orsay. On the south side of the beach, an ancient mule trail rises up the hillside to reach a hut built under a large rocky cave. Beautiful here. <sighs> From the hut, the route becomes more difficult, following in the footsteps of the shepherds who once lived in the mountains. Okay, I still didn't give up, although maybe I should. Because when you look at here, it looks like there's no way. But. If you look precisely, you can find something there. 
So we'll continue just um, just for a moment and we'll see where I get. Let's go with me. According to my Navi, I'm still on track. So, um, yeah, now I will switch it off so I have my hands free. And we'll see if I continue or if I go back because this is quite dangerous, I would say. Ciao. After reaching the large wall of Punta Plumare, overlooking the blue sea below, I follow a narrow ledge. This is where the safety ropes should start, allowing you to safely overcome the easels to reach where the cracks end. But I haven't seen any ropes. The path descended under an overhang steeply towards the sea, and it was hard to tell if it was still a trail or just a rocky landslide. I covered several dozen more meters going down the ledge towards the cliff. But the loose surface and the lack of the safety ropes made me think that the risk was starting to be too high, so decided to stop. I sent my drone out to check if I missed the rope somehow, maybe choosing the wrong path. But looking on the wall from that perspective, I was pretty sure there were no alternatives really and I couldn't see any other ways of reaching the aforementioned ferrata, so decided to go back. fourth ferrata during that trip I missed. But the walk and the views were definitely worth the effort. So if you ever wonder, here is the entrance to this, let's say, ferrata. I'm not sure if you can call it like this. Uh, but if you want to get where I was, is the entrance. There you get the way to the valley. There is a sea. And here's the entrance. After my return, a surprise awaited me. My recorder goes into parking mode when it does not detect any movement and records few frames per second. Saves a lot of space on the card and still keeps an eye on the surroundings. When I went for a walk, I only left the chair on the rear of the car. Usually I also leave other stuff, as I don't bother being in such remote places, but this time it was only a chair. There were traces of a car on the beach as you could see. Those were some park workers in their Defender, so I waved them when they passed me by and drove to where I had parked. The video shows that they stopped for a moment next to my car. Exactly 20 seconds, which is the length of this freezed frame. It was enough for them to come to my car and take the chair standing next to it. Really? An old chair? Did you really have to? As the camera detected movement, their departure was already recorded smoothly. Thanks to this, I was able to register the license plate. I hope it will reach you, and at least for a moment you will feel embarrassed. In the last episode from this trip, you will find out if I finally climbed any Via Ferrata during that trip or not. 